Excellent, thank you. Actually, um, do you mind, can I take a photo of you guys? Is that okay? I won't publish it, I just want to show my mum. Is that all right? <laughs> okay. Okay. Ta -ta -ta. Yeah, that's right. Come on. Oh, so we can. Here we go. Okay, that's great. All right. Uh, oh, hang on. I'll just zoom out a bit. Oh, that's better. That's great. All right. At the count of three. One, two, three. Excellent. Thank you. All right. I'll show, I'll show my mum this afternoon. I'll get to see him. Sorry. I'll put that back up. I'll show my mum this afternoon. Oh, I'll get to, to show her that. I'll see her this afternoon. Actually, if I had the tech, um, what I could do is put it up on the big screen and show you what the, the photo looks like. Um, although we all know what would happen, don't we? We all know what happens when you see a photo that you're in. You zoom in on yourself, don't you? We all know, we all do it, we zoom in on ourselves. Now at one level, that's okay, isn't it? Because maybe you want to see how that new haircut's looking, or you kind of suspect, you suspect you've kind of gained maybe a few kilos you know, across uh, the, the year so far, and you just want to check out you know, how it's going with the double chin and stuff. But, so that's okay. And in some ways, that sense of kind of focusing on ourselves has gotten stronger during COVID, hasn't it? Because it kind of, we lived in our own little world, and in some ways even stronger by our screens, because we're always kind of living in our own little world. Now, at one level, that's okay. But at a deeper level, there's something more sinister going on, isn't there? It's the way that sin programs our hearts and our minds. See, it narrows our vision. Not, not the vision of our eyes, the vision of our hearts. So that we focus just on me. Or maybe, maybe my family or my, my friendship group. But no further. No further than that. Now that's what sin does. See, sin turns us in on ourselves. It makes fo us focus on our own little group of influence or care. So we need our, our minds, we need our lives, we need our hearts opened up so that we can see further than that and, and love wider than that. And God, through the book of Jonah, is calling on us to open our eyes and to open our hearts to love more widely and more richly. Well, let's go back a step and remind ourselves of what we've seen so far in the book. In Jonah chapter 1, we saw the sailors turning back to God and God had mercy on them. In chapter 2, we saw Jonah turn back to God and God had mercy on him. And in Jonah chapter 3, we saw the whole city of Nineveh turn back to God and God had mercy on them. So in a way, the climax of the book comes in chapter 3 verse 10, where it says, When God saw what they, that's the Ninevites, did, and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and it did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Well, that's kind of the end of the story, isn't it? And they all lived happily ever after. We finished the talk, thanks a lot. Right? Except that, that's not right. That's not the end of the story. You expect it to be the end of the story, don't you? But that's not the end of the story. I mean, in the Disney version, that would be the end of the story. You know, they all lived happily ever after. We sing a song, a whole new world, you know, whatever it is. But in the Bible version, in the Bible version, it's very different. Now, in the Bible version, it's so different because as we look at chapter 4, we see that what delights God disgusts Jonah. God dropped, or rather Jonah dropped the bomb on Nineveh, God's word of judgment. But then God diffused the bomb. And how does Jonah feel about that? Well, chapter 4, verse 1. But to Jonah, this, that is God not destroying Nineveh, this seemed wrong. And he became angry. Jonah disobeyed God back in chapter 1. He felt peaceful. Now he's obeyed God and he feels disturbed. See, God turns off his anger, chapter 3, but now Jonah turns on his anger in chapter 4. That's because to him, God's mercy here feels wrong and offensive. It's like almost like a, a Jew, like Jonah is, finding out that Hitler's in heaven, which he probably isn't. You need to understand how awful the Ninevites were. When they captured a city... The kids are out, aren't they? Yeah. When they captured the city, they burnt the kids alive. 
They cut the king into pieces while he was still alive. They sliced the breasts off nursing mothers so that their babies would starve. They would impale captives on, on stakes. They would take key soldiers and cut off their noses and ears and cut out their eyes. And they would skin the royal officials while they were alive. The sin of Nineveh was a stench in God's nostrils and a stench in Jonah's too. But then God forgave them. I mean, how can you expect the righteous to persevere in faithfulness when you keep having mercy on the unrighteous and not bringing on them the judgment they deserve? Imagine another one of those awful, awful mass murders happens. You know, not just in the US. I mean, the ones that are starting to happen, it seems, all over the world, uh, including the disastrous stuff that happened in Sydney yesterday. The prisoner is on death row, awaiting his execution. It's been announced, and so he's led away to the electric chair or the lethal injection or to the hangman's gallows. The families of the victims are there, full of grief and the desire for justice to be done. The violent murderer is given his last words, and he simply says, Sorry. And just before the hood is pulled down over his face, he's given a full pardon and set free. If you're the family of one of the victims, as Jonah may well have been at the hands of the Ninevites, you'd be incensed, you'd be offended, you'd be outraged, just as Jonah is. See, grace seems so scandalous, mercy so offensive. Actually, if you want a slightly more literal translation of verse 1, it says this, but it was evil to Jonah, a great evil, and he became angry. See, it was exceedingly evil to Jonah that God would or could forgive. God described Nineveh's wickedness as evil. Jonah describes Nineveh's forgiveness as very evil. That these violent and abusive war criminals, that these murderers have received mercy? No, no, no! So in verse 2, he prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That's why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. See, Jonah doesn't think that God's mercy is surprising at all. Jonah says, I knew it. I knew it. That is so typical of you, God, so predictable. That's what you always do. The king of Nineveh said he didn't know if God would forgive, if God would have mercy. Remember back in chapter 3, verse 9? He said, who knows? Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger. Who knows? Who knows? Jonah knew. Jonah knew and he didn't like it one little bit. Jonah knew that God would have mercy. He wasn't surprised at all. He even says here in chapter 4, that that's why he ran away in the first place. Jonah didn't run because he was afraid of persecution or failure. Jonah was afraid of success. Jonah says it was God's fault that he ran away, God's stupid mercy. You see, Jonah has good theology. We saw that back in chapter 1. But not a good heart. No love for these people. Jonah agrees that Nineveh is a wicked city. Jonah agrees that God is gracious. But Jonah does not agree that God should be gracious to this wicked city. No, God has no right to show them mercy. That's just outrageous. Which, if you know the history of Israel, is the worst kind of hypocrisy. Because The words he uses really there in verse 2, and gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love. These are the words you read yesterday uh, in your small group from Exodus 34. And in Exodus 34, the context is God's own people, the people of Israel, have rebelled against God, have rejected God and worshipped a golden calf. But God forgave them, and so God reflects on his own character for forgiving them. 
That is that he is uh, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. So Jonah takes those profound words, that profound statement of God's mercy to Israel in the face of their sin and makes it an accusation and and complaint against God in this new situation. Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. See, he objects to God being gracious now to them, though, friendly enough, he was actually happy enough that God was gracious to him back in chapter 2. Remember when he was sucking salt water on the bottom of the sea? No, back then, Jonah relied on the mercy and grace of God, the mercy and grace he now despises. It's because he has no problem with God showing mercy to him but he has a major issue with God showing mercy to them. Jonah in many ways reflects the attitude of his day, the attitude of the people of Israel. God had said to his people in the very beginning, actually before they were a people, but when they were just one man and his older wife, uh, Abraham and Sarah, God had said this back in Genesis chapter 12, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. Jonah loved that stuff. The old Israel loved that stuff. Blessing for them. That's cool. That's fantastic. But the next bit they weren't so keen on. And all nations will be blessed through you. No, he doesn't like that bit. No, 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 no. Many Israelites didn't like that bit. Blessing for others? No, no, not very keen. Now, remember that section back in chapter 2, Jonah chapter 2, where Jonah was praying that wonderful prayer, uh, chapter 2, verse 8, those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. Or verse 9, salvation comes from the Lord. See, Jonah wants those verses, that prayer to be true for him. But he doesn't want to be true for them, not those nasty Ninevites. No, he wants them to cling to worthless idols. He wants them to turn away from God's love for them. He doesn't want them to know the salvation that comes from the Lord. No, he wants them to fry. And it sounds like he's guessed that his own message had a dangerous double meaning. See, have a look in chapter 3, verse 4. In chapter 3, verse 4, here's his message. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Now, overthrown could mean destroyed, or it could mean transformed. He was hoping for burn, but the people turn. They turn back to God. So he's not getting what he wants, which he suspected might happen in the first place. And so, in chapter 4, verse 3, he says this, chapter 4, verse 3, Now, Lord, take away my life. For it's better for me to die than to live. Now, other prophets had wanted to die in the Old Testament. Elijah wanted to die because his preaching didn't work and people wouldn't repent. Jeremiah wanted to die just because of the horror of having to preach judgment. But Jonah wants to die because God won't judge. What is wrong with this guy? Jonah's back to his ministry motto from chapter 1. Death before repentance. God's love and mercy, no thanks. Not for them. Now please notice that Jonah obeys God in chapter 3. He goes where he's supposed to go. He says what he's supposed to say. He tells them the message he preaches. Yet in chapter 4, we see that Jonah is completely out of step with God's gracious plan. He's obedient, but he doesn't share God's heart. He doesn't love the people to whom he preaches, the people whom God loves. Jonah has a heart problem. His heart is too small. He loves too little. Jonah is not just a reluctant missionary. He's a reluctant believer in God's multicultural mercy. 
in God's universal love. He thinks, no, they don't deserve mercy. They don't deserve forgiveness. That's not what your mercy is for. I'd rather die than see them live. That's basically what he's saying. See, Jonah doesn't accept that God is sovereign in giving his grace and mercy. But it's not his decision. God is sovereign and God is merciful. Actually, he makes that point even of the golden calf incident back there in Exodus, in Exodus 33. God says this, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. God gets to decide. But Jonah's heart is stubborn. He is self-righteous. He is self-serving. He is self-centered. In his mind... Jonah must have known that he was saved by grace. But in his heart, Jonah felt that he was just just better than them. Have you ever fallen into that self-righteous trap? The performance trap? I do it all the time. I'm better than them. I've lived better. I've done better. I deserve mercy. They don't really. It's a trap. But God is so merciful that he doesn't blast Jonah for his arrogance, his insolence. Instead, he seeks to teach him. He teaches the selfish and childish Jonah like the child that he is. He gives him a lesson, not a spanking lesson, but an education lesson by asking him a question. Verse 4, but the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Silence. Jonah had a noisy tantrum, and now he gives God the silent treatment. Jonah, the pouting prophet. But God is still gracious and patient with his petulant prophet. Rightly or wrongly, Jonah was angry. God is slow to anger. Jonah is quick to anger. And he leaves town to cool off. We see this in verse 5. Verse 5, Jonah had gone out and sat at the place east of the city where he found himself a shelter, uh, sat in shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. So there we go. Jonah's headed outside town. And you think, well, what on earth is Jonah doing? Well, the answer is pretty simple. Jonah's gone to the edge of town to sit and watch. He gets a comfy chair, a cool drink, a pagola, and he's waiting for the show. See, he's waiting to see if God might change his mind and destroy the city after all. He's there in hope that God would do a Sodom and Gomorrah. Boom. Maybe God has felt the strength of his argument and maybe God has seen the light. Who knows? God may yet destroy a kind of the thoughts of his heart. Jonah, the perversely patient prophet, still waiting for God to teach Nineveh a lesson. Jonah is hoping for the very worst for this people. Can you believe this guy? He wants to see these people destroyed. He's been shown mercy, but in no sense has he become merciful. He wants to see them judged and punished by God. He doesn't want them to be saved. He is so unlike God. The gracious and compassionate God. Listen, this is is a little bit from Ezekiel 33. Listen to this. This is God speaking who says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their evil ways And live. That's what God's like. But actually, even in that verse from Ezekiel 33, there's a little surprise bit at the end. Turn. Turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? See, Jonah, with a sense of moral and spiritual superiority, looks down on people who in the end are no worse than his own than the people of Israel. 
You see, God is not a racist. God is not against the nations. He's against evil. He's against people who rebel against him, no matter who they are and where they're from. And God also wants people to repent and to receive his mercy, no matter who they are or where they're from. Charlie read for us Psalm 145, wonderful psalm. Verses 8 and 9 said this in the psalm that Charlie read. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made, including Nineveh and Australia and everywhere else. Well, that's uh, that's heavy stuff. Uh, it's time for an illustration. Um, Anita's been waiting for this illustration for the whole time we've been working away. You know, you have. Don't, don't, don't deny it. You have, you have. This is a fantastic illustration. This is God's illustration. This bit is really cool. Okay, you ready? This is from verse 6. The Lord provided a leafy plant, uh, maybe a pumpkin plant, we don't know, uh, and made it grow up uh, over Jonah to give him shade for his head and to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. There you go. God installs air conditioning and Jonah is delighted. Ah, that's more like it. Now he's getting the special treatment that he's been waiting for all along. But... Verse 7, at dawn the next day, God provided a worm. There you go, Nathan, there's your worm. Uh, which chewed the, the vine so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the, the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. Okay, so God seems to have sabotaged Jonah's comfortable life. And how does he respond to God's work? With a death wish. But God mercifully interrupts all of this and asks the same question as before. Verse 9. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Good question, isn't it? Because God graciously saved Jonah from drowning with a fish. God graciously saved Jonah from heat exhaustion with a vine. God graciously keeps asking Jonah questions rather than condemn him. And God is gracious and compassionate with Jonah. So God asks this rhetorical question, is it right to be angry? Obviously the answer is no. But Jonah doesn't seem to understand the rhetorical question, and so he answers it anyway. So he says, still in verse 9, it is. I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. Now, that was the illustration. What's the point of the illustration? Here's the point. It's tragically sad when something or someone you care about is destroyed. Tragically sad. Jonah cared about a plant. God cares about a people, the people of Nineveh. Jonah is given a glimpse directly into God's own heart. We actually got a sense of it back in chapter 3, actually. Back in chapter 3, verse 3, it says this. Now, Nineveh was a very large city, which literally in the Hebrew is a, a great city to God. Now, it could mean it's just a big city, but actually here we find that very clearly, actually it means... God cares for it a lot. Jonah cares about the vine. God cares about the city. Back to, to God's lesson to Jonah. Verse 10, But the Lord said, You've been concerned about this plan, so you did not tend to, tend to it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. That's a quick and here, plants come, plants go. And should I not have, had, have uh, had concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, which I think means they're morally ignorant, um, and also many animals. Jonah does not love who God loves, but that does not stop God loving them deeply. He has mercy on them. 
God doesn't want to destroy them, the, the people or the animals. He made the, pe- the people of, of Nineveh and the animals. He gave them life. He's been patient with them, not wanting them to be destroyed. God was concerned enough about Nineveh to send his prophet. Concerned enough about them to change their hearts so they turned back to him. Concerned enough about them to not to turn from his own judgment against them. And concerned enough about them to send his son. For well, Jesus died for people just like those in Nineveh. God was concerned about Nineveh just as Jesus was concerned about Jerusalem and wept over it. God's overwhelming and unlimited love in such stark contrast to Jonah's very limited love. God is saying to Jonah, how can you be so selfish, so merciless, so heartless? Jonah is full of joy about the vine. God is full of joy because of Nineveh's repentance, that they live. Jonah's heart is fixed on his own personal happiness and comfort. But God's heart is fixed on the people who are lost without his message of warning. Where is your heart fixed? What's your heart fixed on? If it's your own personal happiness and comfort, here's God's challenge to you. How can you be so heartless? Kathy and I travel a lot. Uh, we do a lot of we spend a lot of time at airports, um, which is a bit complicated because we have quite different airport strategies. Uh, Kathy's the sensible one, the wise one, and so she tries to uh, arrive early and make sure she's got everything in place and. You know, checks in and sits happily at, at a seat you know, so that, that everything's peaceful and calm. I'm sort of at the other end. Like, I like the rock star treatment, so they're calling my name as I enter the airport. I quite, I quite like it. I feel like a celebrity that way. It's lovely. Well, God is treating you like that kind of person. God is calling out our name and saying it's time to get on board. Here's your final call. Here's a final call to Jonah's heart, that Jonah should share God's heart, get on board with God's mercy mission, his gracious plan to save people from every nation, every tribe, every language. And God is making the same call to our hearts. There are three conversions in the book of Jonah. There's the sailors, turn back to God in chapter 1. There's Jonah who turns back to God in chapter 2, and there's the Ninevites who turn back to God in chapter 3. And after we've read the book all the way through, which one of those conversions looks looks the most suspicious? Jonah. After all this time, has God really got anywhere with Jonah? Is he still running from God? Well, God is still graciously pursuing Jonah, asking him all those questions. We don't know what happens, actually, in the end of the book of Jonah. It's an open story. It's unfinished. We just don't know. And dear brothers and sisters, we, like Jonah, have an unfinished story. It's an open question. Which way will we go? What will we do? Jesus explains his mission uh, in a lot of places, but including Luke 19. He talks about why he came and died, died and rose again, like this. For the Son of Man, that's Jesus, came to seek and save the lost. <laughs> Who are the people we've hardened ourselves against and not worried about because they even despite the fact they're lost? Who are the people we've hardened our hearts against? And we just don't worry about. I think there are lots of people that could be in our society. As you look around, there's lots of people that could be. And we harden our hearts against against Muslims, against Buddhists, against atheists, against bogans, inner city hipsters, country people. Is it against fascists or feminists, the LGBTIQ plus 
or the neighbour who just doesn't care. Not, not that we necessarily kind of hate them, it's just that we don't really care about them at all. And so we don't bother reaching out to them with the good news of the grace that could be theirs. The question is, will we join Jesus in his mission to seek and save the lost by sharing his message? Attempting to share the gospel with anyone, everyone, not just in every corner of Clayton or even Melbourne, but in the sense of the world. Why? Well, listen to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 2. God our Saviour wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. See, we have an unfinished story, but we also have, as our song said, an unfinished task. Will we do things to help others who are lost? Even changing our lifestyle, our lives, our timetables, our five-year plans, even our country, for the sake of the gospel that other people might believe and be saved. Not out of callous obedience like Jonah, I have to go and tell God's message but because we share God's heart. We are all people who are like the Ninevites, lost and far away, but God came looking for us through his son and through his servants. The question is, will we have a heart like Jonah, full of moral and spiritual superiority, but but not much mercy or love for others? Or will we have a heart like God, like Jesus, rich in mercy, loving people and wanting them to come to a knowledge of the truth and be saved, and so sharing the gospel of God's grace with them. Yesterday morning, which feels like a long time ago now, to be honest, feels like a long time ago, well, I asked the question, how's your heart? So let me ask that question again. How's your heart? As we look at Jonah, we see God calling Jonah to be person after God's own heart. We see God calling Israel to be people after God's own heart. And we see we see God calling us, me, you, to be people after God's own heart. So how's your heart? Do you know how much God loves you? And you share God's love with others. Our story is an unfinished story. Who will we be like? Be like God or Jonah? That's the challenge that God is giving us today and throughout our lives. Will we share his heart? I pray that we will. So let's pray. God, our Father, we praise you because you are the gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. We thank you for the gracious way you've treated us in sending us uh, your Son, in giving us the invitation uh, to your grace. And so, please, we pray you would change us by your grace and mercy to be people who are gracious and merciful to others that we would love all those around us and long for them to come to know Jesus so that they too might be recipients of your mercy and grace. Please help us to be more than merely obedient. Please help us to share your heart. For we see your heart in the Lord Jesus and we want to be like him. And we ask this in his name. Amen.